51. We'll be looking at it in its entirety. I want to read the first three verses. Psalm 51. Mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. I want to talk about temporarily disconnected. Temporarily disconnected. You may be seated. My brothers and sisters, this is a song David. after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba, after he had arranged for her husband Uriah to be killed, David penned this song. And as we wrap up this month of mental health awareness, I wanted to lift this issue because I have been troubled that January 31st of this year, Chesley Christ, the 2019 Miss USA Queen, jumped from her high-rise home in New York City and she left a note saying, may this day bring you rest and peace, followed by a heart emoji. April 14th of this year, LSU, 18-year-old freshman, Corey Gauthier of Opelousas, Louisiana, leaves her car on the Mississippi River Bridge and jumps to her death. Just a few weeks ago, Arlena Miller, the young freshman Southern University cheerleader, from Dallas, Texas, committed suicide. And she said this was her last note. She said she lost her connection to God. Her last note, she said, she lost her connection to God. And the Spirit spoke to me when I read that. And the Lord said to me, preach Psalm 51, temporarily disconnected. She opened her note by saying, May this day bring me rest and peace. In her note, she said to my granddad, but you left me and found your own peace. She closes her note and she says, my battle is over and I pray everyone finds peace in that. stuck out with me. 
She had the strength to post it on social media. But she didn't have the strength to pull herself through it. Because she was temporarily disconnected. I want to say to all of us, we need to learn how to speak life to yourself. She didn't know how to speak life to herself. And Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21 says, the tongue has the power of life and death. Now we quote that, but we don't quote the latter part of it. And it says, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. If you don't love life, you cannot eat of the fruit of life. If you don't love life itself and you don't understand who the giver of life is and you can't love the giver of life, you can't speak life to yourself. How can such young sisters choose to take their lives? Now I want to talk about this because when it comes to suicide, we're quick to say it's a sin. We're quick to say it's a sin. And then when a person commits suicide, we're quick to say they're going to hell because they committed suicide. Well, I just want to let you know, you know I have the ability to determine where somebody is going. Because you don't know what happened between the moment they decided to take their life and the moment they took their life and when Jesus decided to receive their life. You don't know what happens. There are no big sins or little sins. It's just sin. A paper cut, you can barely see it, but it hurts. I pinched my finger in the gate a few days ago and it drew blood and I thought it was just a simple pinch but after a while blood came from my finger a few weeks ago I was cutting a string and I allowed the knife to slip and it barely cut my finger I mean barely cut my finger but, but it drew blood I, I came to say this brothers and sisters Sin, as small as it is, sin, as small as it may be, it can draw blood. And if it doesn't draw blood, brothers and sisters, it has drawn blood. Because what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So I don't care whether it's a big sin or little sin in your eyes. All sins are the same in God's eyes. So when you look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 31, the Bible is clear that there's only one unforgivable sin, and that's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So now if you commit any other sin other than blasphemy, it is possible that you can be forgiven. So even if you commit suicide, it's possible that you can be forgiven. But the reality, brothers and sisters, is this. No matter what sin you commit, as long as it's not speaking against God, It's forgivable. Come a little closer. Most folk have enough sense to know not to speak against God. Most of us are smart enough to know, don't you talk about God, don't you talk against God. So most of us don't commit blasphemy. But just in case there are some blasphemous people listening, I, I want to tell you that's the only unforgivable sin. Am I talking to anybody? And so my brothers and sisters, I don't care what you've done wrong, God can still forgive you. Whatever you've done, can I tell you this? Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. And more specifically, don't kill yourself. Can you say that? Don't kill yourself. Say it one more time. Don't kill yourself. 
I, I don't care how bad it is. Don't you kill your, listen, it ain't that bad. I've lived long enough. It is not that bad. I don't care what happens. It's not that bad. You stole something, it ain't the end of the world. It ain't that bad. They put Jesus between two thieves. So what? You lost your job. It ain't that bad. Jesus lost his job. So what? Your husband left you. It ain't that bad. So what? Your wife left you. It ain't that bad. Your kids are going crazy. It ain't that bad. You broke as a joke. It ain't that bad. They repossessed your car. It ain't that bad. You lost your house. It ain't that bad. You're homeless. You're strung out. It ain't that bad. Nothing is worth killing yourself. The Bible says, I was young, but now I'm old. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I don't care what you've done wrong. You may have messed up. You may be tore up from the floor up. But I came to tell you, God can still turn your life around. Let me see if I can't help you. You go and you see the doctor and the doctor says you got cancer. The first thing you say, I got to fight. Well, now if you're going to fight cancer, you can fight whatever else is happening in your life. You got to fight to live. You got to fight to stay alive. You got to make up in your mind, I don't care how bad it is, I'm going to go down swinging. I'll never forget my pastor, the late Calvin Jackson. When I started preaching, he called me, sat me down. We went to, we went to first cafeteria, which was our monthly meeting. And he said to us as young preachers, he said, I don't care what you do. Whatever you do wrong, come to me. He said, I don't care what you've done wrong. You come to me. You come talk to me. Let me tell you something. That was some of the best advice he could have given me. Because sometimes when you make mistakes, you think that God does not want you and God cannot use you. But I came to tell you, God will still use you even after you make a mistake. You can check the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Everybody in that Bible except Jesus has made a mistake. And God has still used them. You have to fight for your life. You have to fight for your life. Make up in your mind when you leave here today. I don't care come hell or high water. I'm going to fight for my life. I am too big to take my own life. Here's where the problem comes in. First and foremost, we don't understand the attributes of God. Look at what this brother says in Psalm 51 verse 1. Oh God. Notice he said, oh God. In other words, he wants God to know that he's got an oh God praise. If you're going through something, you need to learn to say, oh God, if it had not been for you on my side. Oh God, if you had not come through for me. Oh God, if you wouldn't have looked beyond. You need to have an oh God praise in your mouth. See, you think it takes a long time. No, oh God. If it had not been for the Lord on my side. I, I like this, brothers and sisters, because when you look at the attributes of God, you understand the source of your power. The source of your power comes from the attributes of God. He says, oh God, that's Elohim. It's a pluralistic form of God. He's saying to us, brothers and sisters, this is the plural form of a singular God. This is the plural form of a singular God. In other words, whatever you're going through, however many problems you may be having, there's a single God that can handle every plural problem that you're facing. It's clear, brothers and sisters, that there's no implication of any plurality in the divine nature. In other words, only God can save me. Only God can help me. Not my mama, not my daddy, not my brother, not my sister. Only God can help me. 
And I don't know about you, but I've been in some trouble where only God could help me. I've been in some situations only God could get me out of. And I learned a long time ago, it's better to trust God than trust some people. Because the Bible says, trust no man. And I learned a long time ago, my trust is in God. That's why the songwriter said, I will trust in the Lord with all my heart. Brothers and sisters, he says, your unfailing love. That's one of his attributes. It's an unfailing love. It's, it's the kind of love that does not fail. It's the quality of the kindness that's shown for close friends and family members. You see, when you have close friends and close family members, I don't care what you do wrong, they still love you. Okay, let me slow down. Let me slow down. If you got close family members and close friends, I don't care what you do wrong, they still love you. Now, if they don't love you, that means they're not close family members and they're not close friends. Here's what I learned a long time ago. This blows me away. Watch this. God lets you choose your friends. But he chooses your family. Because <laughs> you know, like I know, you got some family members that if you could get them out of the family, you would. But God said, no, I'm going to put them there because I'm going to make you learn how to love them. I'm going to make you learn how to treat them. I'm going to make you learn how to do right by them because you can't help but love them because they're your family. And when you have family members that are close to you and friends that are close to you, there is an unfailing love that no matter what happens, you still love them and they still love you. You can make all the mistakes in the world, but they still love you. That's why I'm always intrigued by a mother's love. That's why fathers don't have the same love that mothers, love, mothers have. Mothers love their children all the time despite the crime. I mean, mamas will go the extra mile, but daddy say, I brought you in the world, I'll take you out the world. But mama will keep on reaching for you. Mama will keep on praying for you. Mama has an unfailing love. Sometimes it's so unfailing that it's detrimental to the livelihood of the child. But I've learned this, when you love somebody, you love them the right way, you learn to do what's going to be beneficial to them even if they don't like it. And I've learned this about God, even though I may not like what God does to me, he still loves me. I may not appreciate the discipline, but he still loves me. I'm trying to tell you, I don't care how bad it is, don't you take your life. Because his love is unfailing. But well, then he says, it's great compassion. It's great compassion. It's, it's great com It's not just compassion, but it's great compassion. So Moses, it's, it's great compassion. It's, it's not compassion. It's great compassion. It, it, it's, it's mercy. It's sympathy. It's tenderness. It's, it's pity. It's sensitive love. And what's interesting about this, this kind of compassion, this kind of great compassion is only used of God. See, people don't have the kind of compassion that God does. Why do you know that, Pastor? Because when he was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. For though they, are not, they do not know what they are doing. See, if, if you are being persecuted by somebody, you want to take them out. But God says when he was persecuted, he says, I'm going to let them get away with it. Because God understands why the persecution is taking place in the first place. See, when you understand the attributes of God, then you understand why God lets you go through what you go through. She said, peace. Peace. It reminds me, we keep saying, rest in peace. We, we've gotten into some stuff these last 10, 15 years. Uh, I don't understand what, what in the world we're doing, but we're getting shirts made up. R.I.P. We, we're putting on the glass of our car. R.I.P. Rest in peace. Brothers and sisters, that's not lining up with the Bible. Oh, I said the wrong thing now. Where do we get this from? Rest in peace. It 
can't even make sense. Rest in peace. If you're keeping up a ruckus, the police comes, you're disturbing the peace. So, so how are you going to try rest in peace? Let, let me see if I can't do it this way. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He gives you peace not when you're dead, but when you're alive. That when you're going through what you're going through, it doesn't make sense. It transcends sense that you will still have peace in the midst of chaos. See, what I've discovered about peace is not the absence of noise. It's the presence of God in the midst of noise. When chaos is happening in your life, you learn peace when you see God operating in the midst of that chaos. So he gives us a peace that passes or transcends anybody's understanding. But when you look at John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But he said, I have come that you may have life and you may have it more abundantly. He's not interested in you having peace when you're dead. He's interested in you having peace while you are alive. So we got to figure out, how do I rest in peace when I'm alive, not rest in peace when I'm dead? What else are you going to do when you're dead but rest? Come here, come here. What else are you going to do when you're dead, sleeping in your grave, but rest? So evidently, rest is not something I'm supposed to get when I die. Rest is something I'm supposed to experience while I'm alive. That's why people are taking their lives, because they're thinking they're going to get rest when they get there. He said, no, I want you to get rest here. How do you know that, Pastor? Because John 14, 27 says, peace I leave with you. In other words, he getting ready to leave, and before he left, he left the peace here. So why do I need to go there and find peace when he left the peace here? I give. The peace I give you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. See, trouble comes and fear comes to mess with your peace. But when you know that he's the prince of peace, that means he must be the son to the king and the queen of peace. Okay. The daddy is king of peace. The mama is the queen of peace. They had a son named Jesus, and he's the prince of peace. The only way you can get to be a prince is you have to be connected to the king and the queen. And the last time I checked, Jesus is my elder brother. And so that means that I'm connected to the king and the, and the king and the queen of peace. But when you look at John chapter 20, verse 21, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, I'm sending you. So he sends peace into our lives when we acknowledge his attributes. We're doing some stuff now that doesn't make sense. So we have a funeral. And then the pastor shares the eulogy to get your mind off the deceased. And then you want to have a parting view. Not here. You won't do it here. I'm trying to get your mind off the deceased. So after I get through doing the eulogy, why would I open the casket back up so your mind go right back to the deceased again? That defeats the purpose of the eulogy. But I got to see them one more time. No, you're going to see them one more time if you got your business straight and if they got their business straight. I'm not trying to see you again down here. I'm trying to see you again up there. I was a boy. It's going to make me touch my granddaddy. Touch him. You'll be touching. Man, listen, I've been traumatized ever since. It's going to grab my hand. I nearly fainted and passed out. 
You're going to make me touch it because it's going to help me. How is that psychologically going to help me to touch it? He did. I've been messed up ever since. We got these long, drawn out funerals. Two and three hours alone. And any funeral lasts longer than an hour, somebody lying. They were a good person. They did this. They, you lying. They were not that good. You gonna hold the body out two weeks until everybody get there. If they didn't come see them when they were sick, why are you holding them out for the funeral? Go ahead and get this over with so you can start the grieving process, baby. You don't need to waste all that time. We got this thing messed up. And then you get mad at the pastor because he's trying to correct it. But I'm here to tell you that's why the Lord brought me here. Saturday is not the only day to do funerals. You can go to heaven any other day, not just Saturday. I know you're mad, but that's all right. Look what he says. Have mercy on me, oh God. According to. See, I, I, I'm just getting to according. According to. He, he, listen, he said, according to, that's from or, or out of, above, it's, it's after, it's, it's because of. He says, because of, he said, listen, I said, have mercy on me, oh God, because of your unfailing love. Out of your unfailing love. It's, it's an unused word in the root. It's an unused root meaning to a portion. It's, it's an unused word root that signifies a part. It, it, it gives the idea of a musical chord a, as a party string instrument. It, it, gives the, it gives the idea of a musical chord. It's a musical chord. Uh, Brother Chris, give me a musical chord. Now give me a musical note. All right, now Brother John, give me a musical chord. Oh, Brother John, oh, there he is, okay. Brother John, give me a musical chord. Now just give me a musical note. Okay, one more time, give me a musical chord. G give me a musical note. Okay, okay, all right. Um, you. Brother Orlando, give me a musical chord. Now give me a musical note. Brother Coffin, give me a musical chord. Now give me a musical note. Listen, God takes all the notes in your life, the good and the bad. And he puts them together to form a chord. He, he takes the good and the bad in your life. And he puts them together and they form a chord so that they come out melodious. They come out beautiful. They come out sounding better. In other words, you don't look like what you've been through. You may have hit a bad note here or there. But the chords that God is putting together in your life is going to make you better than you were before you went through what you went through. Once you understand the attributes of God, then you can appreciate the work of God. When you understand the mercy of God and his steadfast love, you realize he has the power to save you from whatever is troubling you. So I want to say to you, pray about it more than you talk about it. Mental health is not mental help. Mental health is when you reach out for help. But mental health is when you receive treatment for your condition or you do things to make your mental health better. People say to me all the time, Pastor Brown, well, why don't you get somebody to do this and why don't you get somebody to do this? Let me tell you something. The reason I don't act a fool is because I work with my horses. 
and they teach me how to be patient. They teach me how to deal with them individually. And, and so I learned how to be patient with them so that when I come here, I can be patient with you. See, I, I don't hit them upside the head when they do wrong. I mean, I think about it sometimes. And I'm not going to hit you upside the head when you do wrong. I mean, I know it feels like it when I'm preaching, but, but I'm really not trying to hit you upside the head. I'm really just trying to knock some sense in your head. Because how many times are you going to have to hit your head against the wall to see that God is trying to make your life better, but you're going to have to make some better choices? But not only do you have to understand the attributes of God, but you got to know you've got access to God. Can you say access to God? Brothers and sisters, you got to have access to God. Watch what he says. He says, wash away all my, wash away all my iniquities. Cleanse me from my sins. Now here's where he, he gets, it gets interesting. He said, for I know, right there, there it is. In verse 3, for I know. You see, when you know the attributes of God, and you know you have access to God because you become saved. You understand salvation comes through God. Salvation gives you access to God. And so look at what he does in verse 3 and verse 4. He admits his sin. Now, we're trying to hide the sin, but David says, no, you need to admit the sin. So he says, blot out, wipe out, wipe off, blot out, remove. Hmm. It's the picture of someone wiping a dish and then turning it upside down. <laughs> Let me see if I can't help you. It's the picture of wiping off a dish, cleaning a dish, and then turning it upside down. So, so when you wash the dishes, you turn them upside down so that they can dry. And so that they don't get dirty. Notice, notice you turn it upside down. Because see, you're not eating on the bottom of the dish. You're eating on the top of the dish. So once you clean it, you turn it upside down. So that when you go to use it again, guess what? It's clean. Okay, let me do it this way. You have glasses in your, in your, in your cabinet, right? Are your, are your glasses upright or are they upside down? They're upside down. What sense does that make? Because when you pull them out, you want them to be clean. You don't want to have to clean them when you get ready to use them. You want them to already be clean. Wait, wait a minute. Let me get the picture. Let me get the picture. See, it's not the outside that God has a problem with that gets dirty. It's the inside that God has a problem with that gets dirty. See, see, the stuff that's on the outside ought not affect you on the inside because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. See, God is trying to straighten up the outside so that the, I mean the inside, so that the outside can look presentable. Amen, somebody. And when God forgives us, he does not remember our sins anymore. That's Isaiah 43, verse 25. Listen. See, people won't let you forget what you've done to them. But God forgets what you've done to him. Isn't that interesting? And if God has forgotten it, why are you still holding on to it? He said, blot out my transgression. But then he says, wash away to cleanse, to be washed, to be purified. Most of the instances when this word is used, it's associated, associated with ceremonial cleansing. In other words, there's a ceremony that you go through in order to cleanse. It's the idea of washing contaminated clothing. When you look at Exodus chapter 19, verse 10, the Lord told Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow have them wash their clothes. Okay, watch this. Moses, go consecrate the people and then have them wash their clothes. Wait, 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 wait. He consecrated them and then he washed their clothes. What good is it to take a bath and put on dirty clothes? What good is it to be dirty and put on clean clothes? 
Okay, let me do it another way. What good is it for your life to be dirty and we put you in the pool and we baptize you, you come out the pool, go right back and do the dirty stuff you were doing before you went in the pool. Why'd you go in the pool in the first place? See, the ceremony is to signify the fact that something has changed on the inside of you. And now that you come into the pool and you go down in the water, you come out of the pool and now you're a new person. But then he says, cleanse. He said, cleanse from my sin. Wait a minute. Make me pure. Make me innocent. Help me be righteous. It's a ritual purity. It was to teach the Israelites about the holiness of God. And see, when you don't understand that God is holy and we are unholy, then we think that we can control and take advantage of our own life when we forget that it was God that gave us the life in the first place. Here's what I like about the text, and I got to get out of here. David craved this cleansing. David's fall included adultery, lying, and murder. But he admits his sin. Admitting our sin, asking for forgiveness and repentance. Acts chapter 13, verse 22 said David was a man after God's own heart. 1 Samuel 13, 14, God was looking for a man after his own heart. 1 Kings 15, 3, the heart of David was for his father. Brothers and sisters, salvation creates the possibility of forgiveness. And there are four aspects of repentance, and I'm going to, you, I'm going to leave you when I give you this. There's the recognition of sin. And then we have to come to the fact that sin is directed against God. See, we think we're letting God down. No, you let yourself down. Because, see, God already knew we weren't perfect. But then the third thing is the willingness to take responsibility. This is in verse 4. And then there's the abandonment of all claim to merit. That's verse 5. In other words, when God forgives me I can't take credit for what he has done for me and that brings me to the last thing the actions of God that's where the strength of God comes in notice he says cleanse me verse 7 with hyssop and I will be clean wash me and I will be whiter than snow you see he has a desire for forgiveness and restoration so that he can be restored back to God's favor. Sin is deep, is a deeply ground in stain. And it requires a strong cleansing agent. I don't like this new and improved dishwashing liquid. I, I can't stand this new and improved dishwashing liquid. It doesn't make enough suds for me. I'm old school, and, and the most suds you see, it makes you think it's doing a cleaning, a better job of cleaning. A am I talking to anybody? A and due to the lack of suds, I, I, I get the impression that it's not really cleaning the dishes. And see, I don't like a dishwasher. I, I don't use a dishwasher. God gave me two dishwashers. And if I'm going to soak them, I might as well go and wash them. If I don't have to clean them and all that before I put them in the dishwasher, no, I might as well go ahead and clean them. Am I talking to anybody? A strong cleansing agent is required. Watch what he says. Now, he had a physical bag, but now he says, I need a spiritual bag. Give me a clean heart. Give me a right spirit. Because if you look at the text, the right spirit brings joy. Do you want to see David get his line back on? He was temporarily disconnected. But look at what the text says. Restore to me. That's verse 12. The joy of your salvation. You see, if you're going to get your line back on, if you're going to get your connection back up, if you're going to get your connection back up and running, you're going to have to do some repenting. Because repentance means I'm going to have to turn around and go a different direction. Am I talking to anybody? He saw that he not only needed a physical bath, but he needed a spiritual bath. So he says, restore to me the joy 
of your salvation. You see, not the, not the joy of my salvation, but the, but the joy of your salvation. Because Nehemiah says, if you let the devil steal your joy, he takes your strength. I, I came to tell somebody, if you're temporarily disconnected today, you ought to repent and watch God reconnect the service. Have I got a witness here? You want to have the kind of joy that God had when he saved you. You want to have the kind of joy that God had when he picked you up out of the muck and the mire. You want to have the kind of joy that God had when he saw you come down the aisle. All I'm trying to tell you, brothers and sisters, when God see us change our lives, the Bible says heaven rejoices. Have I got any witnesses here? In other words, when your service has been disconnected and you get your life back in order, all of the people up in heaven start singing and shouting for you. Have I got any witnesses here? And the Bible says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit. Have I got any witnesses here? In other words, when you get your service back on, you got to be willing to serve God. You got to be willing to give God praise. You got to be willing to shout even when you don't feel like it. Have I got any witnesses here? But then David says, that's how I'm going to be sustained. Have I got any witnesses here? All I'm trying to tell you is, when you get your joy back, that's what helps you sustain yourself. When you get your joy back, that's what helps you make it through the next situation. When you get your joy back, that's how you're able to keep your head up. Have I got any witnesses here? All I'm trying to tell you is God, I need you to help me keep going. God, I need you to give me another opportunity. God, I need you to sustain me. God, I need you to give me some help. Have I got a witness here? I'm going to leave you here, children. But David said in Psalm 40, I waited patiently on the Lord and he established my going. He picked me up out of the muck and the mire and he placed my feet on a solid rock. Have I got a witness here? All I'm trying to tell you is David said he waited on God and sometimes when your line is disconnected you gotta wait on it. Sometimes when you can't hear from God you gotta wait on it. Is there anybody here going through something today? Can I tell you what? Wait on him. Can you say wait on him? Wait on him. And my grandmama said he may not come when you want him to come but he's always on time. Can you say yeah? But David said he established my going and what that word means is I had been stuck. I had been stuck in the mud. I didn't know how to get out of it. I didn't know how to move. But when God picked him up out of the mud, he allowed his legs to start moving again. Is there anybody here that can testify when you've been in trouble a long time? Sometimes your legs don't want to act right. Sometimes your feet don't want to act right. But I can't even tell you, just wait on God. Can you say yeah? Can you say yeah? Can you say yeah? But I got one more thing to tell you. Isaiah said in chapter 40, verse 31, but they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They mount up with wings as eagles.
eagles, they'll run, not be weary, they'll walk and not faint. I came to tell you today, if you're in trouble and you don't think you're going to make it, I came to tell you, just wait on God and he will show up. Can you see? Yeah. Can you see? Yeah. Can you see? Yeah. My brothers and sisters, when you look at me now, I look like I got it together. When you look at me now, it looks like I got all of my stuff together. But you should have seen me a few years ago. Is there anybody here that can testify? I'm not always been what I am today. But I'm glad that on this day, it's a good day. On this day, it's a good day. Is there anybody that can testify? It's a good day. I said, it's a good day. Why do you say it's a good day? Because it's a Sunday morning. And I found out that every Sunday is a good day. Because I can praise my God. I can talk to my God. I can get my mind back on. I can have my service restored. Can you see it? Yeah. Can you say yeah? Yeah! Ah! Yeah! Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? I'm gonna leave you when I tell you this. But I got to tell you just one more thing, brothers and sisters. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know how long you've been going through it. But whatever it is, you're going through no matter how long you've been going through it the God I serve can show up and when he shows up he'll show out can I tell you this I said can I tell you this tell you gotta ask somebody you don't know about me you don't know about me what do you mean preacher the God I serve brings me through the God I serve brings me out you better ask somebody cause you don't know about me it ain't about me it's about my God and every time I think about what he's done for me I can't help but say glory hallelujah is there anybody here that can say glory hallelujah hallelujah is the highest praise and if God has done anything for you you ought to say hallelujah 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 hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? I'd have given up a long time ago, but he stepped in at the nick of time, and I'm glad. Don't you kill yourself. Don't you take your life. God must use your life. You read the rest of Psalm 51. David said, look, Lord, when you bring me through this, I'm going to tell everybody what you've done for me. I, I said, when you bring me through this, I'm going to tell everybody what you've done for me. Listen to me, brothers and sisters, listen. For God to bring me back to Baton Rouge after 20 years, all the mess I did in Baton Rouge, don't look at me like that. For him to bring me back to Baton Rouge, he brought me back so that the folk who knew what I used to do can say, that ain't him now. I was temporarily disconnected. I got in the band and I was temporarily disconnected. That band will mess you up. The yard will mess you up. But somehow, I got back on track. I came to tell you. I'm not telling you what I heard, I'm telling you what I know. 
Would he get you back on track? You're not going to let the line be turned off again. I was trying to text this morning, not text, but post on, the, on Facebook the scripture and text. And the Facebook page said, no internet connection. I said, look at that. No internet connection. I was, I was trying to post, but it said no internet connection. So, so I went to the back, and I fooled with it, and it said, online. Oh, you missed it. I was sitting out here, no internet connection. I went to the consecration room. It said online. <laughs> Listen, I can't make this stuff up. <laughs> no internet connection here. But I went to the consecration room. It said online. I came to tell you, you may not have an internet connection, but if you meet up with the Lord, you'll be online before you know it. If you're here today, you're not saved.